Welcome to episode 7 of The Reading Cure. In this episode, we'll be discussing the book Our Inner Conflicts by Karen Hornay. Welcome to The Reading Cure, the podcast where great books are what we like to prescribe. My name is Dr. Stephen Davis and my co-host is Dr. Alexander Fox. Now, as always, let me begin with a quote from our featured author for this week, who is the renowned German psychoanalyst Karen Horney. Poets and philosophers of all times have known that it is never the serene, well-balanced person who falls victim to psychic disorders, but the one torn by inner conflicts. In modern terms, every neurosis, no matter what the symptomatic picture, is a character neurosis. Hence, our endeavour in theory and therapy must be directed towards a better understanding of the neurotic character structure. Now, Horney was born in a town near Hamburg in Germany in 1885. She attended medical school at the University of Freiburg, which was one of the first institutions to admit women to its medical programme, and she went on to become a founding member of the Berlin Psychoanalytic Institute in 1920. As time went on, Karen Horney increasingly deviated from conventional Freudian ideas, and this, along with her concern over the rise of Nazism in Germany in the early 1930s, motivated her to make the move to the United States and she accepted an invitation by the analyst Franz Alexander to become his assistant at the Chicago Institute of Psychoanalysis and emigrated there with her daughters in 1932. Horney has been classified often as a neo-Freudian analyst due to her building upon and also revising many of Freud's key ideas. Her best known works include feminine psychology, self-analysis and this week's featured book Our Inner Conflicts, subtitled A Constructive Theory of Neurosis. Delineating the nature and development of neurosis within the personality and the barriers it poses to people's growth and flourishing became a central focus of Horney's mature works, which culminated in her magnum opus, which was entitled Neurosis and Human Growth. She's famous for concepts such as the tyranny of the shoulds, and also for her three neurotic character types, the moving towards, moving against, and moving away types of people, all of which will be discussed in this episode. Now, before we begin, I just wanted to remind you that you can always support the podcast if you've been enjoying our episodes uh, by going to patreon.com forward slash the reading cure. There are £1 and £3 membership tiers, which come with various additional benefits such as prize draws and bonus episodes, and we'd like to just say a big thank you to those of you who have already signed up to support us. So the the first question I think we were going to discuss tonight, Alec, was from the kind of Karen Horney's perspective on neurosis, how how common do you think it is for people to be neurotic in the way that she defined? And how would we recognise this in someone, even perhaps oneself, um, when, say, a person's in the thrall of neurosis? It would be hard to give a, a statistical estimate of how many people were neurotic as Karen Horney would define it. I mean, if we look at Freud, for example, he he saw it as almost impossible to transcend neurosis because for him neurosis was caused by the conflict between our um, inherent instincts, our natural instincts in society. And that conflict was not going to, to change as long as we had a society and we needed a society. So neurosis was never going to be fully transcended. It was more about healing some of the starker divisions in in the psyche, you know, achieving ordinary and happiness. Now, the way that Karen Horney defines neurosis as inner conflicts caused by unhealthy uh, human relationships, that makes it a bit more complicated to estimate how common it is. But I would... uh, I would guess it would be very common up to a point. Obviously, neurosis can vary in extent. But sure. for her, neurosis was caused by uh, the child inhabiting this alienating, emotionally unsupportive and somewhat hostile environment and out of fear, developing strategies to cope, to adapt 
with that that alien world. And okay, people, it may vary the extent in which someone was immersed in that world and continues to feel that they're in that world, but it would be difficult to 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 achieve, you know, to be situated in a world as a child that that wasn't like that at all. So, so in other words, I would think it would be very pre- prevalent, at least to some degree. I, I I would agree with that. Yeah, I mean, I, th- I thought that. Yeah, it's it's difficult, isn't it, to quite um, derive from Karen Horney just how widely applicable she thinks neurosis is. She obviously is is you know differentiating between neurotic and, and normal, but at the same time, yeah, I think it's I think it's hard to imagine a childhood that wouldn't at least to some degree elicit a kind of neurotic reaction from people. Um, the, I want one quote I quite liked from her uh, about the issue of neurosis when she was defining it early in the book is that she says. Uh, so compulsive drives aim at safety, not satisfaction, and their compulsive nature is due to the anxiety lurking behind them. And obviously feeling unsafe is going to be a reaction that we, we all have at times, yes. particularly when we're younger and we haven't got a, a strong self formed yet at that point. So, so yeah, I, I would think they, they may be, they, they, they probably must be would be quite common and in terms of recognizing neuroses then what what do you think would be the signs that we would want to look out for in ourselves or in others um well just just to finish off that point about prevalence if we look at maslow's pyramid or kaufman's sailboat idea that yeah. that the lower down it's survival needs so it is about security and yes it's it's going to be very very uncommon for a human being at the early stages of life to feel that they're they're completely secure. So they're going to feel a degree of insecurity, which then, as you as as the quote intimates, uh you, you know, leads to this compulsive behaviour, looking searching desperately for security rather than satisfaction, which would be more meeting your own needs. So yes, I think it would be very prevalent. But in terms of recognizing it, um Early on in that book, our inner conflicts, um, she distinguishes it from another kind of conflict. You know, so she's trying to define what is neurotic conflict compared to non-neurotic conflict. So when she talks about non-neurotic conflict, she because obviously that can exist, what she means is that... Uh, for that individual, they want to do two things that are in tension with each other. So, they, you know, the person wants to do both things. They're conscious of what they want to do. Uh, you know, they would embrace each of them if they could do them individually, but they can't have both. That That is a non-neurotic conflict. It's something that can be resolved by thinking about what your own ideals or priorities are. In contrast, neurotic conflict is where the person is, you know, to some extent, unconscious of what is driving them. They don't feel that it is them that is choosing it. It's more that they're pushed from behind. Um, So like in Freudian terms, uh, non-neurotic conflict would be, I want to do X, but I also want to do Y. Whereas with you know, neurotic conflict, it would be it would be like it is making me want to do this. It's like they, they're doing it almost against their conscious will. Yep. Uh, so it's like they don't have that autonomy, that choice. That's where the compulsive nature comes from it. And also the thing is they might want they might be getting pushed to do certain things that consciously go against their own moral code. So, you know, they might feel that they're being compelled to be exploitative in some way, even though that's not what they consciously would, and ethically would want to do there. I think that's, yeah, I think that's that's a good way of describing it there. Um, I mean, in terms of what the, the, the this compulsive behaviour that you're describing might look like, I guess it would be when somebody is behaving with an with an urgency that really isn't quite rational in the circumstances um maybe they they seem quite fixated they're not really present to what they're doing there's a kind of loss of perspective and and also maybe a defensiveness would come out in that person if they were say if, if you were to challenge what it was they were doing um so a, a, an obvious example perhaps being the the kind of classic yeah, person who has obsessive compulsive disorder feeling compelled to wash their hands regularly yeah. as a way to allay anxieties. You know, I mean that that person will 
probably be aware that this is a compulsion that they're they're really terribly driven to follow but but the anxiety being such that they they feel they must um yeah um, I, well yes i mean yeah i think that's a really good example about ocd and and i mean it at the moment, I'm also reading this book by the psychoanalyst Theodore Reich, and he talks about the very famous German author Gotha and how he had obsessional tendencies where he felt compelled not to kiss, you know, women when he was a young man in case he might, you know, kill them. You know, he had these okay. obsessional thoughts that that sure. uh, if he kissed them, he would curse them and they would die. So he then, fl- you know, fled. Consciously, of course, he'd wanted to be intimate with them, but unconsciously he was getting propelled, you know, in this compulsive way to avoid them. Somebody like Karl Hornay might say that he had a moving away tendency. Yes, uh, okay. In, in his character, but yes, he consciously he was doing he was wanting to do the opposite to what he felt compelled to do. Yeah, um, I think that's yeah. that's 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 an interesting example there because I, I guess another sign could be we we could say inconsistencies and contradictions as as maybe a yes. sign of an underlying neurosis. Um, like um, a few examples, I thought of you, you know somebody who maybe uh, has strong political views whereby they're really um, actively campaigning against issues of inequality, but maybe they're not very generous with people around them, you know, as, as being one example, yes. you know, where the two don't quite fit. Or maybe somebody who's normally very considerate, you know, ov- overly so with friends, but then has sent a message asking for help with something which they then ignore. You know, the, these little tells in a way that, that would seem, you know, and, and again, these are this, these are examples that we would all at times behave in a contradictory way, but um, they, 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 these would maybe be the signs when something neurotic is, is possibly at play. Um, just maybe to, to move on to the, the second issue, obviously we've you've touched upon earlier in one of your descriptions, Alec, you mentioned the moving away type. Now, we know that um, Karen Horney, one of the things she's most famous for is, is these three character patterns that she she described. Um, and a, a, nice, a nice quote from her from the, our, in her conflicts is this, is that she said, whatever the starting point and however torturous the road, we must finally arrive at a disturbance of personality as the source of psychic illness. So she believed that these personality character patterns are absolutely fundamental and also derive from an underlying basic conflict as she described it. So the the question was what do you what is the essence of each type these these three different personality types and how how do they come about what was our what was our thinking there? So what we see I think is that if so, if a human being didn't have to endure that kind of environment if they if just very hypothetically if a human being was in a situation where they had complete security. Yep. That that person, as they grew up, what they would be able to do in their relationships would be that when they they felt tenderness, affection, they could move towards others. Uh, when they needed to assert themselves because they maybe felt a boundary was getting crossed, they could move against others. And then when they maybe wanted some solitude, they could move away. So... A healthy human being, I think, as she would say, is someone that could act in a very context-appropriate way, that they they weren't always acting in one way that didn't quite sit with what they ultimately wanted to do and the circumstances. But what she was saying is that most human beings uh, develop some kind of defence, some kind of adaptation, so... Uh, they might become a moving toward person and they become overly compliant and they repress their aggressive or assertive side. Uh, they also find it very difficult to be on their own, to ha- to, to enjoy solitude, uh, whereas a moving against type would repress more their affection and would be more consistently hostile. And a moving away type obviously just quits the field altogether and doesn't want to get involved with others because that raises their conflicts. But in each of these solutions, we can see there's a rigid quality there rather than flexibility. I, th- I think so. That's a good. That's a good summary of it. There, yeah. I mean, the, she has other names for the the different types. You know, she in, in other works in in that book at points refers to a compliant or self effacing type as being the moving yes. toward person, which uh, for them love essentially is the ultimate solution to all the problems. You know, so she she describes character traits like being over considerate, slightly naive in their 
maybe overestimation of others, you know, almost a deliberate kind of naivety, very self-reproachful, very un, very non-competitive and so on. So all, all the things associated with a more fragile, dependent kind of self that is really going to be tuning into others such as to get their needs for love and support and affection met, but but of course in a way that is non-discriminating. So obviously you, you said, as you were you were just saying, really, really different situations require different approaches, but the, the strategy is one dimensional. So that would be how the self-facing or the moving towards type would handle anybody that they would encounter, whereas in contrast, the moving against type, which she also refers to as the aggressive or the expansive type, will have a Darwinian mindset, you know, where every every encounter with another is treated with a degree of suspicion as if it's really a competition for dominance. So that, that kind of person needs to repress the softer sides of themselves, also represses their fear, you know, and will focus on the power and achievement and um, it's interesting that those two seem to really be diametrically opposed in a way Hmm. Um, and then as as you intimated the moving against what I understood her saying is that they they hadn't really come down on one side or the other they'd simply detach because uh, you know the the by moving away from people the disturbance between these two say contradictory sides of themselves um, if they're not near people they don't necessarily need to resolve that because there's people that really exacerbates the sense of conflict there so yeah they put this they, she would also call that the detached type of person they yes. they put this this emotional distance between themselves and others and they they focus on privacy and being self-sufficient and really resist any obligations being placed on them or any sense of coercion so um i think these these three types i mean we can all actually probably find ourselves as being somewhere in there or to some extent i think you're right in saying that not everybody is neatly going to fit into one there'll be a kind of elements of of many of them but well and we'll also know people that we can immediately say oh self-effacing that's like Mm. such and such Mm. or aggressive that's like such and such so Mm. it's quite a compelling little typology that she that she's come up with there actually and i think it does it is it does really quite quite fit in quite nicely to our 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 our, uh, understanding of neurosis you know this well it it does Uh, It does. I mean, as I said earlier on, it's built on a common sense foundation, because if if you think about the ways in which human beings could be compulsive in their relationships, they're mapped out by her three types. She's simply formalised them and highlighted the characteristics. But you can see that there are they are very fortuitously built into a commonsensical view of the world. Yes, absolutely. Because each of them highlights possibilities, you know, rigid ways of being, uh, compared to the more flexible person that, that can can be affectionate when appropriate, when they want and when it is appropriate, can be conflictual when it's necessary and enjoy solitude when it's appropriate too. But these are three ways that we can be rigid. Um, I, th- I think yes. another interesting thing that she points out is that one of the main reasons for adopting one of those styles in the main is to achieve a sort of pseudo unity. So as as she said, the neurotic is uh, ridden with conflicts and they're looking for some kind of integration. They can't achieve the integration that would be associated with health. So they achieve a pseudo integration, which is I'll adapt one kind of style of relating and repress other other desires so say like if uh, you adapt the style of moving towards you repress your aggression but it's still there of course so you you then become overly compliant but there is this underlying aggression that can can make you um domineering through your your attempts to to, to achieve yep affection absolutely. or it, it could lead us uh, lead the sadistic age to what you do but yeah, what she's saying is there's an attempt to to unify the self, but it doesn't really unify the self. It just I think that's aids the conflict. Sorry, absolutely. I think that's a great point. Um, these are these are pseudo solutions. They they provide. I, yeah, it's like there's there's a there's a devil's pact aspect to this. Um, so you know, key parts of the self become repressed, so that person can enjoy 
periods where they maybe feel integrated in an artificial way, but but there's a price to pay, which is obviously um, for one thing, a, a lot of their actions are unconscious and will be undermining their primary style, so they might be passive aggressive, quite considerably passive aggressive actually if they're very compliant. So that's a problem for them, and yeah, they don't really maintain a sense of of integration either because because they simply have have split themselves in in that sense. Yes. So. The next stage in what Karen Horney would call the neurotic solution, you know, what would be built on top of these th- different types, purely because they, they, they haven't worked as a, as a solution to that person's sense of anxiety and insecurity, uh, what gets built is an idealised self-image for many people. So uh, again, if they're, say, more neurotic, they, they would they would go a step further in their neurotic growth, um, if you could call it that. So what I was keen to, keen to ask you, first of all, was what what, what is this idealised self-image according to Karen Hornay and how, how does it contrast with something like the, the Freudian superego do you think? Well when she's writing about the idealised self she she says it's been called other things, the superego, ego the ideal and and such like and I, and I think she wanted to make clear that it wasn't identical with the superego or the ego ideal but encapsulated aspects of each and more yes. than that where it differs from the freudian superego is that freud had this idea that uh, we had to internalize our moral system it, you know it was almost like it it wasn't natural it had to be incorporated into the self almost as this alien object that nevertheless directed our conduct that we were not naturally going to be moral but we were coerced into it uh, as a compromise uh, in his view when we emerge from that Oedipal situation so the superego isn't actually uh, what you could call our innate moral code whereas for Karen Horney when she's talking about the idealised self uh, it may have elements of the actual individual's moral principles, but they are heightened and distorted to some extent. So the idealized self can reflect some of the the the, the erotic own potentialities, but they're but they are heightened to almost like a a grandiose level, you know. Uh, yes. So if, if say the person had a creative facility at poetry, the idealized self would be you know, about being a Shakespeare or something like that. So it, it's very much a grandiose version of what might actually be real potentiality. So in that sense, it's a bit like the Freudian ego ideal. It also may incorporate aspects of the person's moral code, but again, it'll be somewhat distorted and twisted so that it it makes the person more integrated than what they actually are. Yeah, uh, I mean, she gives an example of how an individual may, you know, try and reconcile the the compliant, aggressive and reclusive sides of their nature by creating an ego ideal where the the compliant side might be almost like they're Christ-like, whereas the aggressive side might be that they're almost like a prize-winning fighter. And then the, the, the reclusive side might be seen as a wise buddhic like self and yes. as you said there's there's little awareness that you, that these three different personas don't really quite f- gel together Certainly but not, in yeah. the idealized self it's an attempt to bring these different aspects into harmony interesting yeah i i think so i mean I th- it was interesting she 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 mentions in that chapter that as you described, things like the Freudian superego and, and even Adler, the inferiority and also the superiority complexes, all of these things, and in, in, I think in Karen Horney's view, would be generated by this this idealised image of the, the perfect being, the person both as 
feels they they want to be and feels they must be. Yeah, it's, it's both. It's it's like a it, to me it had the qualities of the the punitive qualities that the harsh chastisement of a of a you know a harsh super ego issuing these tyrannical shoulds um, generating these feelings of self hate in the person when they fall short of that ideal. But at the same time, it's also the the kind of grandiose narcissistic you know, imagined ideal that the person can think they are some of the time. You know, all of these things are the ideal. And I, I, I thought it was quite an interesting notion, the way it, that it links up with the different types of, of person or types of neurotic um, character structure that she describes. Um, for example, the, the the expansive or the moving against type would be more likely to just simply believe they are their ideal self. So maybe act in a more narcissistic way or a more grandiose way. Whereas, say, the, the, the self-effacing, moving towards type would be more likely to hold up this this ego ideal as something to really beat themselves with you know it would be the thing they feel they're always falling short of mm-hmm. so they they would really experience a lot more self-hate um as a result of this ego ideal but but yeah it's it's a very i thought it was a very interesting notion and, and as you said it's it's clearly when when looked at under any rational um, you know any kind of microscopic uh, view it, it's completely contradictory it's the person's demanding something impossible godlike of themselves actually that they just could never possibly fulfill so it's again another doomed but more extreme doomed strategy than the the previous solutions i guess well it is yeah it, as she says it's very doomed because it, it's it's created to bolster up a sense of confidence create a sense of unity yeah but what it actually leads to is uh, a greater awareness of inner division and self-contempt self-hatred yeah and um her reference to adler about superiority i think this is very key here as well because as you know adler had this view that um we all uh, in our early years, feel inferior in some way, and so we compensate. Uh, yes. Adler thought there was different ways of doing it. Some were more constructive and pro-social, and others were more about triumphing as an individual in some kind of vindictive triumph, which is what Karen Horney, I think, is more talking about in terms of the idealised self. So her view is the neurotic doesn't really get much chance in their early years to develop a solid sense of confidence because they they are adapting to the world and strategizing and they've got little chance to exercise and fulfill their own potentials, which would give a more robust and secure self. So because they have this insecure self, it has to be bolstered through fantasy, which is what the idealized self is, uh, is, is a phantasmal construction to give them a, 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 again, a, what turns out to be a spurious sense of confidence. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's it, you're quite right. It's it's this because the person lacks any clear sense of their own heartfelt values and it doesn't have that to guide them. They don't have any real solid pride in themselves based on experiences they've had and strengths that they know they've cultivated. Yeah. You know, in, in the absence of that, yeah, there has to be, fantasy has to kick in, I guess, and they have to just actually imagine what they would like to be and, and try to believe that's what, what they are or try to be that. Um, so, yes. yeah, it's, yeah, it's a radical and obviously very divisive solution because, of course, the real self can never, ever be the ideal self. All they can do is, is fool themselves, I guess, when they're in the in the thrall of the, the ideal what we oh, yeah. see with the neurotic is that the ideal self, the idealized self, becomes their standard of adequacy. So yes. they've got to reach these grandiose ideals, otherwise they're contemptible, they're, they're worthless. Yeah. So that's one of the key aspects of of neurosis, as Karen Horn and I would see it, is that the... Uh, these are not authentic ideals. An authentic ideal is something that you aspire towards, but you could never reach. But it's the journey, you know, it's approaching it that is what where real growth occurs. But for the neurotic, it's like I've got to achieve that, otherwise I'm nothing. Yes, that's um, true. It is, isn't it? It's the black and white. I'm, I'm either my ideal or I'm dirt. There's, there's not really yes, any grey yeah. areas there. It's, it's I'm like, either God or I'm, I'm shit. And so, yeah. you know that sort of thing. And what I would say is a, a slight uh, 
well, I don't, you know, criticism, but it's more like an amendment to what she was saying is that I got the impression that, you know, she thought the idealized self was created almost exclusively by the, the, the disturbed human relationships in the child's life. And, and of course, that's going to play a, a tremendous role in the creation of that idealized self. Yep. But I think there are other factors here. One of them is that, you know, that we are so fragile as human beings. And so there is that temptation to imagine, you know, some almost some superhuman quality or some superpower as a, as a sort of way of bolstering our sense of security. Also, children not knowing so much about the world are prone to fantasy and yeah. and would struggle sometimes to distinguish fantasy from reality. And so that idealized self, it sounds like it would be very hard for it not to get constructed to some extent, even in a healthier environment. That's a good point. And I guess the other thing it does is it gives people a sense of direction, actually, that they it's something to aspire to and work towards. People can obviously put a lot of energy into trying to perfect themselves into their idealised self, which obviously can be neurotic and counterproductive. But there is also, I think you're right, there's something a bit inevitable, really, that people would have something they've at least partially imagined that they might like to be and that that would be a motivating, a kind of driving force in their life, actually, you know, particularly when they're younger. And it would be hard to have a clear cut set of values at that at that stage in life. So, um, yes, so yeah, I, that's, I think so. Yeah. yeah, interesting. Um, just another, maybe a a, a kind of minor point to, to move on to. A, a, another step in the the kind of neurotic process, as as Karen Horney describes it, is that, that I think goes hand in hand with this idealized self is externalization. She she talks about it as further what she called neurotic entanglement. So what what does that involve then? The externalization process. The way I read it is that. It- it was very similar to projection, you know, what's called projection in psychology. So yep. projection is where you displace a, an inner conflict or or a repressed desire onto the world. You know, you project it out. Uh, so rather than it being within oneself, it's more in the outside world, either between people or between the world and oneself. Yes. And so, yeah, externalizing is uh, taking your internal or inner conflicts and making out that there are actually some problem with the, the, the external world. In her view, the neurotic does that again to try to achieve some stability, some okay. unity. In other words, um, if, if the neurotic feels that... Uh, the rage is actually something out in the outside world. That's very scary, of course, but at least they don't have to tackle it as an inner conflict, which yes. is actually what it is in reality. So say if you're a compliant person, the moving towards type, but there is this suppressed rage, you could externalize it onto the outside world and the outside world then becomes this harsh, frightening place, but at least you don't need to to worry about resolving your affection and your aggressive tendencies, really. Yeah, that's that's a great example. She, because she mentions actually, th- I think three different approaches to rage that uh, that would use an externalization yeah. method, and one of them being exactly as you described, um, project out on the others and experience it coming back at you. Um, another one, of course, is actually just redirecting one's own rage out at others. So where, you know, rather than experiencing the conflict as something within that you're annoyed at your say yourself about, you just direct it outward um, and a third was the idea of it actually being more manifested in bodily symptoms you know so the person might actually because the anger is repressed they, mm-hmm. they, they feel tensions in their body and, and odd symptoms and then a kind of fixation on those symptoms can happen which again removes the attention from the inner conflict itself actually so yeah that's that rage is an interesting one um, yeah I mean it, it, it's just it's a good example because it, it could be intention with compliant trends yeah but but whatever it whatever it may be i mean say if you're a moving away type of person predominantly 
yeah. you might have repressed more your affectionate side. So you could externalize that and then you might have the sense that people are quite clingy, you know, or trying to, you know, uh, get too close when it might actually be more that you have attributed your own suppressed need or desire for affection onto yes. the world. But again, you don't have to reconcile it within your own person. It's more a conflict between you and the world, which gives it a bit more control and it's not it's not seen as um it seems like it's more a an amendable conflict rather than one that is within oneself and it's a lot harder then to resolve. Absolutely, yeah. And of course for the moving away type and that that example you gave there, they they would of course resolve it by moving away further. You know, keeping people at more of a yeah, distance yeah. to further. Um, now, I, and of course, as with Karen Horney's previous neurotic solutions here, it's another stage, another step towards a greater degree of self alienation. Um, I kind of, to me, it seemed like she was suggesting this is almost the borderline between the psychotic and the neurotic here, because the person's increasingly not experiencing reality quite as it is. Is that fair? Do you think that's the point where these two would meet, or is that is that maybe not quite quite how I she think, saw it? I think yeah, I think that's fair. Um, the the more externalizing that we go on, then yes, the more it would approach the psychotic. And yeah. I mean, Fritz Perls, the one of the founders of Gestalt therapy, he he um, he worked a lot with projection or externalization. So in Gestalt, what the what they encouraged was um, being able to say I to one's project projections. In other words, to bring it back into the ownership of the self. Yes. So, for example, um, and, you know, you can see these videos on YouTube of Fritz Perls working with people, but uh, I can recall him working with some student that, that uh, was sitting in front of an audience and expected them to be uh, very judgmental. And so he then asked her to pretend or speak what they were saying. What he was actually yep. doing was encouraging her to reown her projections, her externalizations, to actually take that anger and judgmental nature back into the self and own it, really. Yeah. And yeah. the reason why, and, and he said this is waking up from the nightmare. So what, what he meant was that if you externalize or project your subjectivity, you end up living more in this dreamlike world. Uh, yeah. where it, it's it's shaped too much by our subjectivity. Uh, and by bringing it back into the self, you can distinguish what is me and not me. Uh, one of the things that, that Karen Horney says is the problem with externalizing is that the richness and variety in the self is reduced. If you're If you're projecting out your rage onto the world then you no longer really have that as part of your inner palette of emotions. Yes. Uh, anger, say. You know, it's something that you you are lamb-like and the world at large is violent. So you don't have access to your own aggression and so the self is shrunk. And this is why Perils, with his uh, work on projection, would be working on the, 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 the individual... Uh, reclaiming that anger uh, back into the self. Yeah, I think that's a really good uh, parallel to draw there. Actually, Alec. Yeah, the um, that that's that's it. I mean, the the person who is who is doing so much projecting or externalizing is going to feel very empty. Actually, their their yeah. emotional life will be so reduced to the 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 emotions they've allowed themselves to themselves to feel. Um, obviously, the the more they're in the the grip of the idealized self, and the more that's off limits, and the, you know the more. Oh that yes, yeah. You know, it's, and and it's, I think also a very important thing to highlight here is um, something that the Jungian Robert Johnson wrote about in his book *Our Inner Gold*, and mm -hmm. what what he meant by that is that what we externalize can sometimes be our greatest gifts. Okay. So you might you might have someone that really admires another uh, and maybe admires them more than what is warranted precisely because that person has externalized some gift projected it out through through away their inner gold 
Yeah, yep. So it isn't always just, you know, directly problematic things. It's not It's not just that a person might externalise their envy. It might also be that they externalise their creative gifts and things yeah. like that and impoverish the self even more. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, the, the sort of tragic waste of human potential, actually, when somebody is so you know neurotic to that degree exactly as you described all this energy could be fueled by aspects of their aggression but you know other parts of themselves that are just more directly alive actually that they are you know in this doomed attempt to mold themselves brutally into this idealized object they're actually giving up the the true the true growth the true joy actually yeah. they could have experienced on this path She talks a little bit later in the book about the fact that people who are particularly neurotic often end up in quite a hopeless state. Um, what do you think are the are the barriers that people face when it comes to trying to actually overcome neuroses, trying to work through them, that maybe that leave them feeling a little bit despairing and stuck? Um, well, one of the barriers, I think, is that the structure, that the neurotic structure, may not do ultimately the job of eliminating conflict and giving a sense of integration. It can ultimately do that job. Sure. But the person still feels it's the best thing they can do. So the so trying to dismantle that neurotic structure is going to be very difficult. You certainly shouldn't be trying to do it right away in a gung-ho way because the person is going to feel terrified of what it would be like without that because if on some level it would throw them back into that time when they were a child and they were in this forbidding world where they had to adapt and if somebody was just trying to take away strip away that whole neurotic structure uh they would feel you know tremendously defenseless yeah of course so that's one of the barriers in that you know it's going to take people Obviously, it'll vary from individual to individual, but generally it's going to take quite a bit of time for people to feel uh, that they can risk that, that they can relinquish those defences. Because they were built on this edifice of fear, it's going to take quite a lot of cajoling and reassuring for them to relinquish that. So in other words, there's going to be a lot of resistance to it. I can imagine. Well, I mean, of, of course, the nature of having the, the idealised self for a neurotic person is precisely a lack of a real sense of, of deep inner self, you know, a lack of sense of robustness, actually. So uh, yes. inevitably, of course, when you when the idealised self starts to, to, to become apparent to them, they'll start to wonder, well, who am I then? And, and what, yes. what have I got left without that? So it must be quite a scary a place for people to be, I would think. Understandable. Well, yes. that, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, yeah. I remember reading about that mystic Gurdjieff that uh, he had demonstrated hypnotism one time in front of some of his followers. And uh, he took this man in his 50s that was very erudite or seemingly so, um, very cultivated, and he hypnotized him. And when he spoke more without those defences, he was more like a child, okay. really, underneath. Yeah. Now, whether this is illustrating what Karen Hornay is speaking about or not in a literal sense, I don't know. But what I'm trying to say is that sometimes when defences are taken away, the actual self might be quite a bit younger yes. and much more immature than the, the false edifice that has been created. And we can see that. I mean, we know many famous people, many talented people have behaved in strikingly immature ways. Um, Absolutely. Despite, um, shall we say, a a more overt, cultivated self. Uh, And if we see it like, as Winnicott would put it, in terms of the true self, false self, if the false self has been covering over the 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 true self for a long time then the true self as you say might not be that well developed might be rather hazy and uh, and waiting to get born so to speak 
Well, I mean, there are there are so many problems there for, for a person contemplating that prospect, actually, because for one thing, um, their, their imaginative construction, the ideal self they want to be, will seem so much more appealing because it's almost so much easier to just believe, no, you're, you're already fine, you're already actually perfect, or at least it's the, this looms ahead of you. But yeah, to give that up, actually, and then face head on the prospect of being a much more potentially immature self, a less a less developed, a more vulnerable self. None, none of that is going to seem terribly appealing to the person. So I suppose it will take time for them to be convinced that it's still the better option for them, actually. It still comes with prospects over time, of course, of them feeling like a happier, more secure person. Um, another, another aspect that occurred to me that maybe um, is an inevitable barrier here, and again, you'll no doubt be very familiar with this from your work with clients, Alec, would be just the, the fact that it's going to take a lot of time for somebody who's who's built up these neurotic defences mm. for them to be kind of very slowly brought into focus. So hopelessness must be a part of that process at times where maybe it seems it's too slow for them. You know, they have a, a period where it seems productive and then it's, you know, there's a bit of a lull. So I guess that they have to have a sort of a lot of faith and a lot of patience to see them through this process, which, you know, for a neurotic person actually might be particularly hard to have. I would imagine. Yes, yeah. Well, I, I think it's the hopelessness is going to arise, bec- uh, in part anyway, because they're trying to become an idealised self, which they can't become. Yes. So there's going to be that sense of futility. But the reality, at least as I see it anyway, because I don't want to sound too dogmatic about it, but the reality as I see it is that... Um, in as far as we're neurotic, we're trying to be a self that we don't need to be. And and what I mean by that is that the neurotic believes that they've got to actualize this image, their own self-image of the idealized self. So yeah. the act you what what I what I would want to say is that the neurotic, in as far as somebody's neurotic, they think they have to actualize an idea or a concept. In other words, the, the, the real self that they're trying to become is some concept that they must then inhabit. And that is not what actually the self is. I mean, you know, Carl Rogers' original work highlighted that the most self-actualized people were the people that didn't want to define themselves too much conceptually they didn't think about a self-image sure. what they what they did was they more articulated what he called their experiencing in the moment and they trusted their experiencing in the moment they didn't feel that they had to have some architectural plan in their mind of how they should be they didn't yep. really think about what they should be they were trusting more what they wanted to do and what they thought was right in that moment, in that context. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, um, it's, it's it's the spontaneous part of their being, really, isn't it? It's rather yes. than the, the part they've thought about that's static. It's it's the it's the part that's more joyous and and unself aware, at least in the moment. You know, in terms of trying to yes. project a particular yeah. look. It's it's just the um, there was well, a bit more actually. Oh, sorry. No, no, go on. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the uh, Winnicott would say it's the playful self. You know, it's yes. connected with play. It's connected, as you say, with spontaneity. It's connected with inner trust, which is what the neurotic lost originally, a trust in themselves. And that's why they've built up this architectural plan, this idealised self that they're trying to become. Yes. But, uh, yes, the, 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 the self-actualised person doesn't have that prototype in their mind anymore. They they are spontaneous, playful, and moral, uh, and and they think about the context. I mean, I remember seeing a, an excerpt from an interesting interview about David Bowie, and he had said that he did not define who he was. You know, okay. he would never define who he was as an artist. He just said he went with his instincts and what he wished to explore at any given point. Uh, yeah. in his career which which again th- this is the this is the problem isn't it for the person in the grip of the idealized self that you know they want nothing more desperately in in some cases to be like a bowie you know to be a superstar who's who's recognized for their 
their talent and their, their contribution, but it can that kind of art could never be actually created by somebody who was too much in the grip of an ego ideal because it's the absolute opposite of a creative process there. You know, it's a it's an imaginative in a way, but it's stifling of of, of their their core their vitality, you know, the parts of themselves that could flow out and create interest in art. Um, yes, I, I, and you can see that in his career that he used personas, he used masks to inhabit his self at a given time, and then he threw them away. Yeah. Because he yep. knew that the self, the actual self, the evolving self didn't need them anymore. Didn't need them, didn't need to be a, any kind of fixed entity actually no. reducible no. to that. Yeah, yeah, yes. interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, well, I mean, the, the, this kind of brings us on to the last issue, really. Which Could is, I just say one last thing about that? Of course, actually, of course, just, yeah. The, the last thing I would say about this is another reason why the neurotic doesn't want to uh, move forward or, or, or change themselves too radically is that, at least initially, they're very much caught up on the idea that the way they're behaving is the way they should be. Yeah. So while Karl Hornei speaks about the tyranny of the shoulds, you know, the shoulds associated with the idealised self, the neurotic, in as far as they're in the grip of their neurosis, believes that uh, to actualise this is, is what it means to be moral. So the idea of giving that up is seen as like, well, not being ethical, almost. That's a so good that's point. another yeah. resistance, another point of resistance there. Yeah, that's a really interesting point. The person the, will, of course, see this this ideal as is is the, the almost the definition of goodness. So how how immoral to suggest they stop trying so terribly hard to perfect themselves yes. and be this good creature? Yeah, it's such a kind of counterintuitive lesson, actually. That for for to, for a, you know, sort of subjectively speaking, until until people really yeah see 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 why it is. <laughs> To lead into our final question, there was there was a nice quote which I think um, ties in lo- nicely with what you were just describing there from Karen Hornay um, in the uh, final pages of the book. She says that the most comprehensive formulation of therapeutic goals is the striving for wholeheartedness, to be without pretense, to be emotionally sincere, to be able to put the whole of oneself into one's feelings, one's works, one's beliefs. And she says it can be approximated only to the extent that the conflicts are resolved. Now, she obviously has an optimistic view actually compared to somebody like Freud about our potential to outgrow our neuroses. So do you think she's right about that, uh, to be optimistic? And if so, why why would you think that? Well, I, I know there's this uh, counsellor, professor of counselling, Colin Feltham, that has written a, a number of books that's, uh, that, that go a little bit against the grain. And in one of his books, he, he says that... Uh, in his experience, everybody is neurotic to some mm-hmm. extent. And sure. I would agree with that, that I don't think that uh, it would be wise or even healthy to believe that any person could transcend neurosis completely. So my view would be that we would all be neurotic to some extent, which is not to say that we we can't become less neurotic and more fulfilled, uh, more fully functioning, as Carl Rogers would put it, or self-actualized, as Maslow would put it. I mean, I think that they are possibilities, but the idea that of reaching some non-neurotic level would seem to be, seem to me to be very rare. Um, well, I mean, of course, it's one of the big five, isn't it? That, you know, we, we can measure people in a yeah. sense for neurotic traits. And so everybody has a score. I would, I would, have, I mean, it would be, yeah, as you say, I mean, it, it seems almost implausible that anybody could be zero in the score of neurosis. We must all have this to, to some degree, of course, surely, surely. I think so, yes. I mean, we have to be a little bit careful about the word neurotic in both cases because I don't think Karen Hornay's use of neurotic and what they mean in the big five are quite the same. There'll be overlap, but I think when they talk about neurosis in the big five, they're talking about negative affect. So the propensity to feel sadness, rage, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, So that's not quite the same as, I think she's using it more in a psychoanalytic sense. But I take your point that all of us will be on that spectrum of, Neurosis in the big five, 
And I think all of us are going to have some neurotic conflicts as part, which which will lessen in severity the more that we work on ourselves. But I, I don't think that I've encountered anyone that that would be free of neurosis. Completely. Neither would I. No, I, I would completely agree with you. I, th- I think that's so. So yeah, I mean, but we all we all have it. I think we all have it. I think that's undoubtedly the case. I think again, it goes back to the 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 incredible circumstances sort of somebody's childhood that would be needed in a way for them to grow up without some neurotic yeah. Yeah, traits having developed. Um, well, so the reason, that- well, the reason I mention it as well is that, well, for one thing, it's what I think is the truth. Uh, but also the reason I mentioned it is that there is a danger that if we did believe that there was some non-neurotic utopia that we could reach, it actually then becomes a kind of rather perverse form of an idealised self. Um, right enough, yeah. If you see what I mean. So the idea that we could transcend neurosis completely becomes a sort of therapist version <laughs> of the idealised self. Likewise, when Carl Rogers spoke about conditions of worth, you know, what we believe that we've got to, to reach to be worthy, that would be connected to the idealised self. But to, to think that we could reach a point where we had no conditions of worth, that we were free of that, again, that seems like an idealised self uh, to me. Uh, that's that's true. I think you're right. And but do you think then, if it's the case that we are all somewhat neurotic, uh, which I would agree with you, um, that therefore is optimistic actually, because we can also see a huge variation in how much people are thriving. Oh, so if we all have this, then in theory um, we should all be able to work against that. I guess it should be all you know up for grabs in that sense. Yes, I I, th- I think so. I, I mean, in in my view. I see with clients, I've seen with myself, that as you work on yourself, as you get more in touch with what you genuinely feel and you don't, you know, fall so much prey to self-deception or projecting your tendencies outwards, the more that you could be honest about what's going in oneself um, and trying to resolve that, the more freedom that you've got as a person, the more you can then become that spontaneous, playful self. So I can see that with clients as, as time goes on, as they, you know, resolve their problems, how more spontaneous they become, how they might even joke about a previous problem. I think yeah. humour is one of the best signs that a, pre- a previous problem has been resolved to some sure. extent because it's a sign of that they've achieved a degree of freedom and an increased spontaneity that they didn't previously have. Absolutely. I think I think um, for me, Karen Hornay's work's particularly inspiring, actually, in this regard. You know, I think she's one of these people these people that really gives you the sense that uh, great ideas can actually be life changing because as we were discussing earlier our, our work is it's co- it's commonsensical it's, it's it's accessible but she also actually believed that we can do a fair bit with self analysis actually yes. we don't necessarily i mean therapy obviously she's very much in favor of that route as well but you know even actually just reflecting and thinking through the different conflicts that she delineates and and starting to look for them in yourself and others and and working on yourself in that way is a real possibility for her and I thought that was really quite encouraging and certainly for, for me, I mean, I've I found Karen Hornay's ideas some of the most valuable that I've encountered in terms of helping me kind of work on myself, so um, I, yeah I mean, I, I certainly, to me, her optimism is actually realistic and it's not starry-eyed optimism because it doesn't in any way downplay that it's a tough road to go down for people actually working through yeah. neuroses, it's slow, it's difficult and <clears throat> excuse me, it doesn't always work out for people unfortunately there is an element of circumstances too there but i think she is i think her optimism is justified actually i think i think that's 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 fair it's not naive actually um no i I wouldn't i wouldn't say that her optimism was was naive because when you read her books uh, she makes it clear that this is an arduous path and that there's many obstacles to relinquishing the idealized self and replacing it with something more authentic. I mean, what in the two books that that we've read, I don't think that uh, two of her main works, I don't think that she's maybe delineated, understandably, uh, some of the societal 
obstacles really there. I mean, say like in our day and age, uh, you know, what we see on TV, what we see in movies, you know, how people look like physically is almost like encouraging us to have an idealized physical self. Of course. Um, yeah. And this this can lead to lots of problems like body dysmorphia, yeah. eating disorders and things like that. So society yeah. is quite a bit up uh, against us in this, in, in, in this uh, move to becoming more authentic and less beholden to the, the idealized self. Because the idealized self will you know, power many an advert, many a marketing com- campaign. Yeah, that that is. <clears throat> I think that's a good uh, that's a good point. Actually, is that I mean, we are in a, a, a particularly for younger people, as we've discussed previously. Social media influences, the adverts, the films, all these things do make it hard to escape thinking in terms of an idealized self and and the, and the kind of neurotic disturbances actually so yeah i mean it, it is on the one hand possible for people to change and grow beyond these but yeah there's no getting beyond the the difficulties that are bombarding them actually from their environment especially these days i, I would say well so, the, yeah, the, no, there nice. is and, and and i wonder what she would write if she was living today about uh, the popularity of superhero movies and mm. such, and, and I'm not saying that that's you know completely unhealthy or anything like that, but but the desire, you know, how much we might be drawn now to this notion of superpowers and how this might be connected to an idealized self as well. Yeah, it's a good point, isn't it? I mean, it's such a such a popular genre, and yeah, I mean, it's it's essentially a, a fantastical depiction of what people desperately might like to be in a certain mindset so there's no doubt i mean that there there must be a reason these are these are so popular and yeah i wonder i wonder how uh, i think she she might well have uh, noted that connection there um but yes i mean I, I, as we're talking about her um i feel her work does very much you know join hands with carl rogers work in the you know how he saw the therapy encounter the therapist is unconditionally accepted of the client. Uh, they are as honest, as congruent as they can be with them. They're also trying their very best to understand the other person's point of view through their empathy. That It's almost like Carl Rogers is saying the therapy room is like a corrective to that basic conflict situation that we discussed earlier on. It's like the inverse of it. It's actually an area where the 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 real self the true self could could appear for once yeah and grow indeed and and a, and a much needed sanctuary actually yes. from from you know these these negative societal influences yeah I yeah think so, so I think her work um, ties in very very well with Carl Rogers there in terms of uh, his his views you know a big corrective to that. Uh, original hostile environment that the child felt themselves that the, the, they were in and yeah. they tried to adapt to. Absolutely, yeah. I quite liked as well that one of the, in her kind of concluding section, she also delineates quite straightforwardly four con- conditions that she would see as the 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 non neurotic way of being, um, which are quite straightforward actually, and I thought quite useful maybe to reiterate, which is that she thinks we need to we need to know our own desires as clearly as we can. So we obviously need that self awareness. We also need to have a capacity to renounce some of our desires. Actually, we must accept that there's a trade off, and that's life that we can't have everything we can't have contradictory things we must have a clearly delineated set of values and convictions from which we're acting which are not those that we've simply unconsciously internalized through this you know this punitive ego ideal demanding we do this and that we've actually rationally um, evaluated these things and made our own judgments and then lastly we have to be able to bear a sense of personal responsibility for our actions um, and, and maintain that responsibility even when we get it wrong we must be able to actually own it in that way and I thought that's quite four quite nice straightforward again um, you know ways of thinking about a healthy person actually who is secure active in the world has a clear sense of their identity but but without the the the, the traps of the ego ideal what what do you think is it does, I the, think, does I that think that's a very good yeah. summary and it ties in a bit with um some freudian thoughts so this when she said about 
knowing our desires and then relinquishing some of them. Yeah. This ties in very well with what Freud was saying about repression because for Freud, the idea was that because we repressed some of our desires, which we didn't really know how to cope with, we couldn't ultimately relinquish them. That's the problem with repression. They're still sure. there. Yeah. Whereas if in therapy, for example, the the client can get to a point where they can acknowledge their repressed desires and then feel safe enough and valuable enough as a person to relinquish them, then they have then resolved that conflict. And this is what Karen Horn is talking about, I think. Um, repression, I think so, yeah. is, repression is not relinquishing. You have to have enough consciousness and self-knowledge to relinquish. So it's like repressing, it's like replacing, sorry, relinquishment instead, uh, repression with relinquishment um, there. Also, exactly. reg yes, also regarding the moral thing, um, clearly where Karen Horney uh, is more optimistic than Freud is that I think she believes, and I would agree with her, is that we do have an innate moral dimension to ourselves again it needs to be cultivated but i think we do have that whereas freud was more skeptical about that he saw morality as more something imposed yes but, but her optimism there is that we have this moral dimension to our being which could be cultivated and drawn out and we can then have authentic ideals this is what winnicott meant by the personal superego Okay. Instead of the impersonal one, which is what we see Freud suggesting that we all have with a court, just like Can Horn, I would believe that a personal superego, in other words, these are my ideals, this is what I believe in, this is what I think is right, is yeah. achievable. And I think that, uh, again, what I would say, Stephen, is that if you looked at someone's superego, you would probably see a mixture of those two qualities of the more authentically held values versus the more internalised ones and rejected yeah. ones. I think that's a good point, isn't it? Again, we, we, it's it's always difficult when talking about, say, contrasting the neurotic with the healthy. You know, it's, it's difficult to avoid the, the simplification there, which comes from the fact that, yeah, we are probably going to be an amalgamation of both, as you suggested. So, you know, the, degrees, it's, it's yeah. It's yeah. So the 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 healthy is the is the true ideal in a way that we 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 aspire to rationally, but it's not something. It's not a state we you know we just believe ourselves to have attained. It's obviously that's 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 what gives life a kind of purpose again in that sense. And yeah. and obviously yeah. um, that's the that's that's again where the ethics are a little bit. To me, I, I mean, I don't personally have a problem with the fact that there, that yeah, there are values and there are kind of, you know, there's a moral dimension and you know inherent in Karen Horney's perspective here. But to me, th those four kind of criteria for healthy living, um, they don't seem like a a kind of say like set of Western values smuggled in, you know, with some sort of you know individualistic t or anything like that. Because I think they're quite broad actually, and I think they just really describe a person thriving for and what for, according to whatever particular values they've yes. they've are delineated that seem to be relevant to them. So well, I, she's I, not I think, putting the individual against society. I, ex at, indeed, at yeah. All. No, um, she's not seeing them opposition op in opposition. No, I, I don't think so. So no, I think um, yeah, I think she is. She uh, to me, she's inspiring. She, I think you're right about the connections with Rogers. I think Maslow as well. You know, obviously there's that humanistic um, link there. You know, she's she's talking a bit more about the the route to self actualization as much as it's possible. Um, that I th I think Maslow would probably recognise to some extent. Yes. Um, he was probably even more optimistic, actually, than Karen Horn. I obviously she emphasises the the tough the tough journey that the person has to undergo. But um, but yeah, yeah I think it's... I think so. And uh, I mean, many people have been influenced by Karen Horn. I mean, Albert Ellis was one okay, one of those people. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, the REBT rational behaviour therapy is about attacking our musts and our shoulds, and so he was very much influenced by Karen Horn. I's notion of the tyranny of the should okay, yeah. and how the the idealised self is based around that. So Ellis wrote a, a paper uh, that, that said it was something like how REBT shrinks the ego. Mm 
And what he meant by that is that if we deconstruct these shoulds and realize that we rationally shouldn't be trying to uh, actualize them, that we're shrinking the ego, but in her case, it would the way she would call it, call, what she would call it would be the idealized self. Yeah. I think so. I mean, I think I think you're quite right. No, I think she's a, you know, the the, the connection there is definitely very much evident, and I think she is. She's such an important thinker. Actually, I think she's somebody that really is worth engaging with. You know, she yes. really, um, she yeah, she provides a really interesting and optimistic view of of human potential that yeah, not not surprisingly has has influenced a lot of people. Um, well, I, I I think we're just about at the end of the the time slot for for. Uh, for this one well, Alex, thanks for that Stephen thanks as always for your contribution 